Nicola Daniels for the Cape Times, and today we are in conversation with anti-apartheid icon and former Constitutional Court judge, Albie Sachs. He was in prison while practicing as an advocate at the Cape Bar and also blown up after a bomb was placed in his car by apartheid agents in Mozambique. After he returned to South Africa, he played a key role in drafting the country's constitution. Today, we will reflect on how far South Africa has come in achieving its freedom. Our first question um, for Freedom Day, firstly, what does Freedom Day mean to you? What does it mean to you? You know, it's, it's everything. We used to shout freedom in our lifetime and, and the days were terrible then. Mm. Apartheid everywhere, people thrown into jail, mm. didn't have the vote, we couldn't speak. Books were banned, organizations were banned, everything being crushed. Freedom in our lifetime. My mm. boy, Africa. We had that gleam, that dream, and people said it's impossible. Black and white can never live together as equals in South Africa. Impossible. It, it is not impossible. We're going to get it. The majority are with us. The world is with us. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. And we got it on 26th of <laughs> April, 1994. And people said there'll be chaos. And it wasn't chaos. People stood in line for hours and hours and hours. One old African man was brought in a wheelchair. He wanted oh. to vote before he died. He was very, very ill. Yeah. People cried and they sang and they yipped and they laughed and they waited quietly to vote. So it was a huge day, a massive transformation in our country. He didn't build a single house. He didn't provide a place in school. He didn't mm. create a bed in the hospital, but it meant everybody counts. Mm. South Africa in that sense, at least on that day, belonged to everybody for the first time. And the majority of South Africans are black. Mm. And for the first time, we were going to have majority rule in South Africa, the mm. whole nation voting. But majority rule with a Bill of Rights that said everybody, black, white, brown, Male, female, young, old, mm. straight, gay, all equal. At least mm. in principle now, it is a transformed country. And that mm. was an enormous change. Mm. We've still got huge problems in South Africa now. Inequality is immense, it's unemployment, mm. it's, it's <coughs> violence, and so on. But the Constitution gives us the means to deal with all those things. So mm. for me, Freedom Day is not just a nice day where we all go to. It, it was like a revolution yeah. in our country. Yeah. And I was glad to be part of the process of, of getting there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's um, interesting. You actually, I think sometimes it's easy for us to forget about that meaning, about where we come from, because um, we're so caught up in everything that's going wrong today that we actually forget. Um, it wasn't an easy road to get here. Um, so this day is a very special day. Um, and then how far do you think South Africa has come since we have, we've achieved um, democracy? Well, the changes have been enormous, but not, not nearly enough. Mm. Uh, one huge change is South Africans speak their minds. They can speak out. I can say what I like on this program. You can ask me hard questions. Mm. That's fantastic. Uh, we, we, we take that for granted mm. and we, we, we're angry when freedom of speech is being limited, but the whole space is completely different. Mm. I mean, when I think of my own life and I'm an advocate, I'm relatively privileged, relatively protected. I was thrown into jail twice, not for anything I did, just on suspicion security police. My house was raided many times. Mm. I was held in solitary confinement. I was tortured by sleep deprivation, and I'm privileged. It's so much worse for so many people with darker skins than mine who had electric shock treatment, uh, hung out of windows, and so on. Afterwards, in exile, I was blown up. I lost an arm, the sight of an eye. Why? Not because I was doing anything bad, because I believed in freedom. Mm. My books were banned. This is me, you now privileged South African. So for the mass of the people, they, they were, were being choked and suppressed. And in that sense, it's a huge gain. We can speak our minds. Mm. The elections that we have, we're going to have now municipal elections in October 
It's meaningful. Mm. You can track them out. You can support them inside the organizations that to choose people who will be popular. Mm. It's a form of accountability. We never had that before. Mm. Only 10, 15 percent of people had the vote. And even then, it was in conditions of, of banning and suppression uh, of, of views and, and so on. So that's, that's been important. Mm. And in other ways, we had to bring together, there were 16 departments of education before. Can you imagine? Education for whites, who got five times as much spent per child as against education for black Africans. Separate education for people classified as colored, separate education for Indians, as though one and one makes two is different for, for different sections of the Yeah, population. it doesn't make sense. Mm. And then for the different provinces, we had to bring that all together. Mm. One of the most amazing things was amalgamating the armies. We had the South African National Defense Force run by whites, dominated by whites, mm. controlling everything. In quanto where seas were, the, uh, there had been fighting, guerrilla struggle, Many people losing their lives in the struggle. They were enemies. They had to be brought together in one organization. Wow. The the Zanda, the the, the, not Zanda, the, the um, uh, Zapu had some armed units. The mm. Transkai Defense Force had units, uh, and the PAC had their own uh, structures. Also had to be brought in. I, I could never imagine that happening. And within a couple of years, they've been integrated into one organization. Mm. It, it still got its problems, but it's something that seemed to be impossible. And we created whole new structures and systems in the country mm. with everybody voting for their councils, uh, democracy becoming standard mm. uh, and, 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 and protected by the Independent Electoral Commission, free and fair elections, five mm. times. The races used to say in the old days, you really mean one man, one vote? It will be one man, one vote once. And it hasn't been once. It hasn't mm. been twice. Three times, four times, five times. It's not going to be six times. So, so these are profound changes and very important for our people. In terms of material things, uh, something like nearly three million homes have been given free to people living in shacks. They're not fantastic homes. They often far away from places of work, but they've got water, electricity, uh, sewage, mm. uh, and, and some protection that's very, very important, mm. and that people can respond to that. So three million, that means homes, at four per home, it's more 12, 13, 14 million people have moved, a quarter of the population. That's quite big. Mm. Water reaching 90% of the people. Uh, <coughs> electricity, when you don't have the the outages and so on, between 90% of the people, important mm -hmm. for the poor. You don't have to cook with fire anymore. You don't have to collect water at the river, especially important for women. So there are profound changes in that sense. Uh, the social grants now reaching 15 million people, saving people from starvation. They go hungry, but from starvation to hunger is, is a big change. So it's not as though they haven't been changed. And the poor appreciate that and realize that, even while they're complaining and mm. correctly complaining about so many of, of the programs, the municipal programs, the service delivery, that's not going properly. There has mm. been sort of real change. Mm. I'm saying all these things, not to say that everything is hunky-dory, it's not. We mm. have major problems, massive inequality, the corruption is totally, totally unacceptable. But there has been real change in the lives of millions of people. And what I think is exceptionally important, the Constitution gives us the means to hold to account those in government mm. through the vote, through the exposure. Mm. We've got journalists now, fantastic investigative journalists, exposing these things. So it's mm. painful. We've got it's on the commission exposing these things, it hurts, it hurts. But it's much better that it comes out into the open, that it's known, that we have the courage to look into our failures, to mm. place them in front of the nation, 
to demand accountability for them. So these are all for me, the things that give me courage and hope for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and a sense that just as we struggled so hard to get our freedom in the basic sense, so we still have to struggle hard to realize the promise of freedom and realize our full rights uh, mm -hmm. under the constitution. That, that brings me to the question, do you think um, integration is possible? Because the one thing that I think is we're quite physically divided. And now, if you because we economically also, things are so imbalanced, it's very difficult like for, for people to kind of, you, to, to really integrate. Everybody doesn't get the, don't get the opportunity. Um, yeah, do you think it's possible? Of course it's possible. Uh, you know, if it is possible to segregate, it's possible to integrate. And yeah. we've got to do it. Mm. And this whole thing is special apartheid. Mm. It's still so profound. And sometimes the market, the market doesn't overcome it. The market favors those who are powerful and wealthy, who mm. mostly happen to be white, and allows a relatively small number to move in. What is important is there's a very, very large black middle class, not a rich middle class, not a secure middle class, often in debt. But the people who are buying the motor cars and buying the fridges and buying the stoves and the clothing, by and large, the black middle class driving the economy now. But still, people live far away from work. Mm -hmm. uh, still a very divided society in that way. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I noticed things like uh, at the University of Cape Town, mm -hmm. it's still in many ways a white institution. You feel it. Mm -hmm. In the architecture, some of the names, some of the traditions there. But you walk on the campus now, and it's largely black people mm. uh, and they the doors of learning are opening uh, when, when i when my wife vanessa september got a master's degree two years ago it was so thrilling to see the new vice chancellor welcoming the parents who come down from limpopo and kzn and from mm. rural areas of the cape to see their children graduating mm. still a long way to go at uct but Change is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, change in broadcasting, change on the Cape Times, where, where you are today. Mm -hmm. There is a change everywhere. But sadly, the housing situation, the accommodation situation, is still very, very rigidly divided, not through law, but through economics, through practice, through opportunities mm -hmm. that people have. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Tell me, do you think, in terms of the housing situation, because even if we look at um, entry for buyers um, to buy to buy property, it's very it's very expensive, um, which is another dividing factor. Um, tell me, do you think there needs to be more regulation in terms of the way that because you know it's it's willing buyer willing seller at the moment, so a buyer can put up put any price if the seller is willing to pay it. Um, so yeah, tell me, can regulation possibly fix that, help that? And would it make a difference? I think there have, have to be a whole range of different policies. You know, the, the Trafalgar School, uh, which was sold off uh, for very useful uh, young Jewish kids uh, having access to a school, that's fine. But there's a lot of space there. And extra space could have been used for social housing. To enable people then to move in from some of the benefits that the new owners got, sharing it, and, and, and the court held that the sale was invalid because it didn't take account of the need to overcome spatial apartheid. Mm -hmm. So that's public land yeah. can be used to, to deal with it. Rental properties could be made available for people who don't necessarily are able to afford uh, expensive housing but they can pay rent, they're earning. Uh, that's many parts of the world. Mm. The majority of people live in rented accommodation rather than their own home. Uh, it just requires concerted effort. And I think all planning regulations, not only pub uh, private land, but even not only public land, but mm. private land, uh, should take account planning of the need to overcome spatial apartheid. It's not only a need, it's a requirement 
to heal the divisions of the past. It mm -hmm. requires a new mindset, and you can't just leave it to beneficence and, and kindly people uh, and, and some philanthropists, although they also have a role to play. It requires mm -hmm. concerted efforts. Yeah, interesting. And then tell me, as a white South African um, during the struggle, why did you feel it was important, um, you know, to fight for freedom, even though you could have um, enjoyed the benefits that were afforded to white people during apartheid? I was born into it. <laughs> uh, I didn't stand a chance. Uh, my mom was the typist for Moses Kotani, the General Secretary of the Communist Party. My dad was Sonny Sachs, the uh, Secretary of the Garment Workers Union. So I grew up in a world of struggle. I hated them, assuming I'd automatically follow them. But when I got to university, I met a young crowd, very progressive, revolutionary if we regarded ourselves. And mm -hmm. I thought, yes, this is where I belong. And people sometimes say, you know, Comrade LB, you made such great sacrifices for the, for, for the struggle. For me, the sacrifice would have been to be a white South African, to sacrifice my soul, to sacrifice my beliefs, to sacrifice my humanity just for the sake of a comfortable life. That would have been a sacrifice. But to be in the struggle, to be with others fighting for freedom, that was a huge privilege, much more important than the privilege of a white skin. To feel the energy, the dream, to sing the songs, to march in the streets, to work in the underground, to go overseas and to campaign against racist South Africa. That was a joy. It wasn't a sacrifice, it wasn't a hardship. Mm. And afterwards to help to write <clears throat> and, constitution, and then to get on the court defending that constitution. It, for me, it's been a blessed life and not a life of sacrifice at all. Uh, a life of involvement, uh, a life of, of generosity and meeting wonderful people along the way and also meeting lots of groups and scallions inside our organization quite often. That's not something new that came that mm -hmm. came with freedom. But on the whole, the whole was always better than the parts. And and we always managed with people like not only Mandela, who's famous, Albert Lukuli, uh, Oliver Tambo, uh, 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 Walter Susulu, uh, Chris Harney, whom I worked with. We used to meet under the trees in Newlands Forest, which just burned down now. Doing clandestine work with Chris Hani and Archie Sepeko and Reggie September uh, and, and Alex McGrimmer was there and Brian Bunting and Ted Connerson, dreaming of freedom. Uh, now we will see achieve uh, the, the transformations we were dreaming of, some of them. Mm -hmm. Socially, economically, we've still got a long, long, long way to go. But some of the breakthroughs have been made. So for me, it's been a chance life even although I look a little bit tiny with my short arm. Uh, 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 it, it, and, and, and I've had some shocks in my life. On yeah. the whole, it's been a, a life of, of comradeship and, and achievement. Another interesting question. I read somewhere that you said um, that we would have had a president for every race group in South Africa. Please share that story with me. You know, and Nicola, it's not so well known. People yeah. think we just all sailed through with our constitution. Right until 1992, which for me is recent for you. I don't know if you were even born then. Or how I was two. <laughs> okay, okay. So right until 92, when negotiations had started, there was a total clash between the ANC, liberation movement side, and the regime side. And the regime, the government, the enemy, we had different names, the other side, insisted on three presidents. It would have been Mandela on Monday, the Kirk on Tuesday, Botulesi on Wednesday. In fact, it would be one year, one year, one year. And they would have to agree by consensus, governing by consensus. Can you imagine? It would have given the whites a minority veto. It would have kept our nation divided into at least three different groups. It would have been total paralysis, but it would have brought race right into the constitutional program. We fought against that. And that was really why we had the breakdown. It wasn't only the massacre uh, uh, um, uh, that, that uh, uh, made 
the ANC withdraw from the negotiation, uh, although massacres played an important role in it, there was a total clash of visions for the new South Africa. Group rights, parliament for different racial groups, or a non-racial South Africa. People have their rights, not because they're majority or minority or black or white or brown, because they're human beings. And we fought for the right to have rights as human beings. And whites are human beings. And colored people are human beings. People in origin are human beings. But they're protected as human beings, not because they belong to minority groups. And that was the big clash. Uh, and finally, after rolling mass action in 1992, during the breakdown period, the regime came round to accepting the non-racial United South Africa, then we could move forward. And the next year when Chris Hani was assassinated, we got a date for the elections. That was vital. If we didn't have a date for the elections, the country would have exploded. So elections in that sense saved South Africa and elections have got to keep South Africa going. Tell me, brings me to my next question. Do you think the Rainbow Nation project has failed or not? The which, which nation? The, the Rainbow Nation the, project. Rainbow Nation. You know, there was never a Rainbow Nation project. The term Rainbow Nation was used proudly for the first time by Archbishop Desmond Tutu in St. George's Cathedral the day after Chris Hani was assassinated. And he came forward and he said, we are the rainbow nation of God. We will not be deterred by this assassination. It was a proud, forceful statement by him. Very, very affirmative. It wasn't a soft, oh, wouldn't it be lovely? We got all the colors together. Let's be nice to one another. Unfortunately, the notion of the rainbow nation has come to look like, let's all be nice to each other, which is wonderful for the whites who've already got most things and not so good for the people who haven't got. In that sense, there's no equality in the rainbow nation. But the idea of everybody belonging to the nation, South Africa belongs to all of them, that hasn't gone. It's still there, it's still profound. We all speak our minds, we all get cross with all of each other, mm. not as members of this race or that group or the other group, as South Africans, as human beings who are angry or excited, who are loving, who are generous, who are kind. That notion won't go away. It's still very, very powerful. You can call it a rainbow nation if you like. Maybe it's a discredited notion now because it sounds too soft, too illusory, uh, mm -hmm. too unreal. So maybe it's better not to use that symbolism and language anymore. But the idea of a united people with the exact majority and fundamental rights of everybody, that is central, it's still extremely important, it still guides us. Now, another question I wanted to ask is protest action. You know, when you speak about, we, we speak about when we're unhappy about something, we, um, we fight for what we want. And so this, this idea of protest action, is it necessary? And then there are also instances um, recently that I've seen where local government um, actually want to sue groups for damage to property, which is, yeah, I want to hear your take on that. Yes, well, with a right to protest, it's, it's internationally recognized by the United Nations, and it's very clear in our constitution. Uh, and the court has ruled at attempts to say, you can't protest without permission, permission mustn't be, you know, all of that could make it possible. Uh, so the right to protest is guaranteed in our constitution. Peaceful protest, not to protest with uh, fangas and machetes and spears and obkiris and guns and rifles. That's not permitted. So it, it, it's not even open to question in South Africa. No. Then you want protest that doesn't disrupt the traffic. You don't want protest that smashes windows, that leads to looting and so on. That's not protest. That, that's mm. just thuggery. So these things, the ordinary criminal law, come in uh, to control. And then it's you balancing out the way the protests take place with the need of society to function without too much disruption. Uh, and, and the leaning is in favor of the right to protest. In terms of, of the claims for damages, 
I think that matters before the courts as a former judge, uh, I have to unfortunately seal my lips. Yeah. But uh, uh, the, the general rule internationally uh, is, is that the leaders of the protest can't be held to account for what individual members of the protest do unless they encouraged it or uh, facilitated in some way or another or didn't take reasonable steps to ensure that there wouldn't be unruly behavior, some, something of that kind. So there's mm -hmm. quite a lot of, of international law. And in fact, the late Christoph Haynes, professor at Pretoria University, who sadly died only a month ago, he was the head of a group in the United Nations that clarified all these issues. Uh, and, and the declaration that he brought out is something that could be used in any court action. Mm -hmm. uh, that shows what international thinking are, is in relation to questions of, of damages like that. Okay, interesting. Okay, I think a closing question. Um, tell me in terms of reconciliation, um, has the reconciliation project, has that project, I know we touched on the Rainbow Nation, but now the reconciliation project, has that failed or are people too impatient? Are people not, because we are also a young democracy. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay, you know, that's not a success or pass fail thing where you give it marks. It's a process, it's an ongoing process. It's achieved a huge amount that seemed impossible before. The Truth Commission was so painful. People told their stories. It came out, it was acknowledged. The pain was acknowledged. The crimes were exposed. And even people who committed the crimes and the violations came forward and acknowledged what they'd done. That was huge. It was very, very important. But we still remain a divided society and an unequal society. So until we get real equality in South Africa, in terms of life experiences, in terms of opportunities, we're never going to have full reconciliation. Mm. But we don't say you either have it or you don't have it. You work at it all the time, nonstop in all sorts of different ways. And sometimes it's noble, grand gestures. Sometimes it's just tiny little things in your place of work, in, on the sports field, in the school. It's happening all the time. And we have advanced. We're way ahead of the ugly apartheid South Africa. We're way ahead, way ahead. Don't you say nothing's changed. But wow, we've got a huge way to go. Judge mm -hmm. Albi, do you have any ideas um, for changes that we can make to help us? Um, yeah. I think everybody should be thinking all the time in the places where they are. You on the Cape Times, in your place of work, in what you write. Uh, I'm. Uh, suddenly finding a whole new lease of life to uh, what's called intergenerational exchange. Fantastic, this intergenerational <laughs> thing, you know? It gives us old, oldies uh, a place, and it's not, not seniors whom you've got to be nice to, but old people who lived in different times who've got stories to tell that become valuable. So that's what I do. Uh, it's in relation to if you're a domestic worker, in your places of work, you ask questions. If you're an employer, you also open up to the lives of others. Neighborhoods, in the schools, parent teachers associations, in the unions, such a huge role to play. So I think it's not just a massive forward movement, it's tiny little things that everybody has in, in their power to do. Something very much on the go right now is Defend Democracy campaign. Mm. And, and, and there's a wonderful project that Constitutional Hill Trust is, is advancing to enable people to phone in and write in and use Instagrams and so on to finish the sentence, more or less uh, to complete sentences of the kind of country that we want, to speak out your voices. And it's going to be displayed in lights on Constitution Hill, on the towers of what was the old prison where people were locked up right next to the Constitutional Court. 
So that's another way of people expressing themselves in a very vivid and, and meaningful way in all the languages of South Africa. Wow, that sounds really, really interesting and really, um, it's going to be exciting to see. Thank you so much for your time. This was amazing and it's been a pleasure um, to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas.